spend much time on chapter one uh, because we're almost done. But most of you are going to be dealing with our financial audits. Um, this is where we're doing a lot of the financial statements where we're auditing the balance sheet. We're going to be doing the income statements, the standard statements. Our goal is to prepare for, is to have financial statements for preparing a conformity with GAAP. And it has to be performed by a CPA. That's the one thing. Not anybody. You can't just be an accountant and issue an ordinary financial statement. That's, that's so weird. You can do other kinds of things as an accountant, but the issue um, of financial statements, somebody who signs off on them, the ultimate sign off, not everybody who works on the financial statements on a job has to be a CPA. Take a picture again, an accounting firm has a bunch of people, partner, manager, people on down. Not all of them have passed the exam yet, but the person ultimately signing off has to be a certified public accountant. And the users, and this is all going back to financial accounting. Who the users of our statements are management, investors, bankers, people who money, people who are using it for purposes of analysis. The other types of audits, and then we again the first the first chapter is on the, the, the subject of this course is auditing. So it's not necessarily just financial statement auditing over even though once we get done with this chapter, that's all we're really going to be dealing with. But there's other types of audits, compliance audits. For example, IRS audits of income tax returns. Um, that's a big part of our practice, big part of an accounting firm's practice, is defending clients when the, the Internal Revenue Service or any of the other taxing authorities come in to do an examination of their tax returns. If you're wondering how often that happens, it's really not that often. I don't know if you've seen some of the statistics. The IRS only audits roughly about 1% or less of tax returns. Um, and so it's not like they go through a lot of them. They are understaffed, uh, budgetary concerns these days. Um, so you don't see a lot of this anymore. Operational audits. We have a group. All accounting firms have this. Uh, people who do this. We'll go in and, and, and we'll measure the effectiveness of operations of a particular department or a particular company. Some of these higher accounting firms, they're, they're a consulting group that come in. We have, they have expertise that they've gotten over the years in how to run a business more effectively, more efficiently. And you can do an audit on that to determine whether or not they're running the business as efficiently as possible and how they can run it better. And then the one thing is integrated audits. And this is this has to do with public companies and public companies only. This is when the auditor is not only doing assurance on the financial statements. But also the effect of this internal control. And this is again what came off of Sarbanes Oxley. But the auditor, the auditor in the past only had to do number one. They had this little proviso on one and said, okay, the auditors have to do that too. And created a whole new what's called cottage industry for the accounting profession to do both things. So based upon that, you see there's other types of auditors. One of the other types of auditors is internal auditors. Most large companies will have what's called internal auditors. Those are people who are checking things throughout the company, looking for fraud, looking for misapplication of accounting principles, if they're looking at accounting things, or just non-compliance usually with uh, company policies. Uh, make sure the record keeping and everybody's staying in line. One of the, one of the main places you're going to see this Internal auditors, this is of course in a bank. Thankfully, it's going to have tons of internal auditors going out, going to towers, checking the cash, going in the going in the, in the vault and checking, checking record keeping. Any place where again money is a key component and a very used part of a business, like it is in the bank, you're going to have internal auditors. But any large company is going to have internal auditors, um, and usually they report up to not as people very high up in the business, sometimes not even in the accounting department. They usually will report up maybe to somebody even as high up as the chief executive officer, just to give him a good feel for what's going on in their business. Of course, you have government auditors doing all kinds of stuff, and tax auditors. Um, I don't know if anybody here ever wants to work for you know one of the taxing services as an auditor. There are some benefits. One of them is not particularly hot pay, I'll say that. But good hours, um, early retirement, early pensions, things of that nature. People are going to work for the Internal Revenue Service. 
We talked about internal auditors just a couple seconds ago. <coughs> like you said, excuse me. They perform operational compliance stuff within the company. They address internal controls on a regular basis. And then they report, like I said, high up, like to the audit committee of the board or to the president of the company. Not necessarily up through the people they're checking on. So if they're checking on the accounting department, they're not going to be reporting to the CFO. I'm not going to spend any time on the GA or the tax auditors. Let's talk a little bit about the American Institute of CPAs. Guys get certified, you're all going to join this. It's one of our governing bodies, and what is their role in what we all do? Well, they establish standards, auditing standards. But only within, again, the private sector. They're not, their role is not in the public sector. That's going to, we're going to talk about that in the next chapter in a couple of minutes. It's the PCAOBs. But they do what they establish standards, they do all the research and publications. CPE, one of the things I think we talked about, if I didn't, I'll repeat it. You get certified, you need to keep your continuing professional education up. And you need to register it through them. They're the ones who track it. You're required to get 120 credit hours every three years. What do you think about that? That's no big deal. It's like 40 credit hours in a year. You know, you go to, you know, you go to an all-day seminar that's seven. And if you're going to work for most firms, on the firm, most accounting firms will give you all the continuing professional education you need to fulfill that. There's regular seminars on varieties of topics that all the firms give. We even do it in our firm, we do it for our outside for our clients. We have these morning sessions about 10, 12 times a year where we give three hours in the morning of continuing professional education. Our clients get to come in, they mingle, we get a few hundred people. They get taught something and they get, a continu they get the continuing professional education that they need in order to keep their license. And it's a self-regulating body. It doesn't report to anybody the AICP other than ourselves. Under there is what's called the Auditing Standards Board. Again, the Auditing Standards for the for the private for the private side of the practice. <coughs> no, excuse me, non-public companies comes out of them. They're the ones who issue the auditing standards, the SISs, and issue the standards for attestation. Engagements, which we'll talk about in a little bit. These are these are not audits of financial statements. These are other things, and there's a variety of things like forecasts and projections uh, and agreed upon procedures that come under there. In other words, non-traditional financial statement audit services. They also issue what's called the SOAR. This is NRS. These are the standards when we do review services. Something we'll cover later on in this semester. It's when we do less than an audit. When our clients don't need an audit and don't want to spend for an audit, they take a service that's a little bit lower <laughs> or review. And if they really want to get really bargain basement, they can get something called a compilation. And we'll talk about that later in this class. We won't spend more time on it. Again, research and publication. Journal of Accountancy, it's a monthly magazine that they publish. Uh, the Tax Advisor, again, and other audit publications. Industry Audit and Accounting Guides. Mentioned this last time, the industry. Remember, <laughs> what you're going to learn is if you become an accountant, there's a lot of specialization by industry. Accounting is no longer a very generalized practice, especially as it relates to the larger firms. You're not going to be just a CPA. You can get away with that when you work in a small firm, and if you're going to work for the big four or a firm like ours. You're going to, at some point in time, not to the distant future when you start, and wind up specialized in some particular industry. The industry, the accounting industry, has just gotten too complex. The auditing practice is too complex. The world too complex. For anyone to know everything. As a result, everybody's going to sort of find their niche. Talked about continuing professional education. The AICPA offers it. Well, they, they do things online. Um, they certainly offer courses you can go attend. The state so societies do it. <coughs> if you get certified, the New Jersey Society of CPAs up in Roseland has regular seminars. And then other professional organizations. And you've got to be sort of, I don't think the word's licensed. It's authorized. In other words, not everybody can just say, okay, I'm giving a CPA session in the account. 
You've got to be a registered with the AICPA giver of professional education. The accounting firms, of course, all are. So again, if you came to a common resident in the fact, uh, seminar, you would get credit for uh, continuing professional education towards fulfilling your CPA requirements. We have regulations, again, on the individual CPAs. We have a code of professional conduct, ethical rules, and a requirement for regular membership in the CPA. You belong to a firm, you become certified, all the firms require you have to be a member of the AICPA. And then you have a division for public accounting firms, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, where they, they're monitoring the work of the public accounting firms, and there's two different divisions there. One for, one for companies that issue audits, and one for companies that don't. A lot of accounting firms do not want to be regulated, don't do a lot of audits, don't want to keep up with all the requirements and what's called a peer review, meaning somebody else coming in to look at their work, looking at their audits, so they say, listen, when I got two audit clients, I don't want to be in the audit business. It's too risky, and you're in the audit business, the insurance costs go way up. One of the largest costs in an accounting firm is professional liability insurance. <coughs> it is extremely expensive. I would say it's probably... I wouldn't be surprised if I looked at a profit and loss statement in most accounting firms. Right after salaries and rents, professional liability insurance would probably be right up there. And if you look at the numbers in the big four, it's astronomical. Reason? We are the most... We're the easiest target to get sued when a problem exists. The tax returns fly out of it's my accountant's fault. And when it goes bad, it's my accountant's fault. If somebody goes down the drain, it's the accountant's fault. So oftentimes the accountant gets blamed when things go wrong. That's why insurance is so expensive. CPA exam. I think most of you know something about it by now. It's a must. Um, if you're going to be successful in this business, your chance of being successful without having passed this are very, very slim. I will tell you this, if you're interviewing for a job at any point in your career as an accountant, those three letters are going to stand out to whoever looks at you. It doesn't matter. You maybe had great jobs somewhere, worked for big companies in prestigious positions. People are always going to take a look and say, why is that a CPA? So I kind of can't recommend to you enough, excuse me, take it, take it as early as possible, and get it behind you. It's just nothing to be put off. The firms are all required now. Any of the major firms require you to pass the exam within a period of time. They don't fire you. They don't fire you. Let me put it that way. No one will fire you because you haven't passed the CPA exam, but they all have regular rules on promotion. And you can't be promoted past a certain level without passing the exam. Uh, who issues you your licenses? It's done by the states. It's not done by the AICPA. If you pass the CPA examination, the State Board of Accountancy here in New Jersey will issue your license. Um, besides passing the exam, there's education and experience requirements. If you go to a cap public accounting firm and you work in a tax department from the day you start, you got to be pulled out of it for six months to do some type of accounting or audit work. You can't do it just for the tax. Other people involved in the industry, no, not important. Talk a little bit about the PCNOB. Uh, again, they have, they have the rights on the auditing and attestation and all the rules related to preparation of audit reports. Only for public companies. This is again all as a result of Sarbanes Oxley. The PCAOB reports up to the Securities and Exchange Commission, and they have the rights over all the public companies. ASCPA takes the private companies, PCAOB talks, deals with the public, the ones you can go buy stock in. And they discipline CPAs and CPA firms. They come in, they perform inspections. They are very tough, I can tell you. I've seen them in our office. <coughs> they can they can hear about investigations and disciplinary proceedings. And they can sanction you. They can sanction individuals, they can sanction firms. I've seen instances where they can come in and say, okay, 
the firm can continue doing a public audit, but that individual right there for the next six months or a year is precluded from working on it. They can do things like that. If they find overall the firm's work is good, but one particular individual's work is no good, they can say. And they can sanction the firms. There was, I don't remember who did it, whether it was the SEC or the PCAOB, a number of years ago sanctioned one of the big four and didn't allow them for six months to take on any new public companies. So if you're a public company looking for an auditor, you couldn't go to this particular firm. That's a big deal. That's a lot of business they potentially could have gotten during that time that they didn't get. The SEC, we know who they are. They were created back in the 1930s as a result right after the stock market crash to protect investors in the public by making sure the information they were getting was proper, um, that the securities are properly registered, um, and one standing making sure that you know the accounts are doing what they're supposed to do and companies are doing what they're supposed to do so the general public isn't being defrauded. Talk a little bit about what accounting firms do. If you went to a major accounting firm, what would the services you'd be looking to see that they have? Well, attestation and insurance services, that's number one. That's the financial statement stuff and anything that comes off of it. Um, it's probably the number one part of most major firms' practices are the audits, the reviews, and the attestation and assurance services that we provide. Number two on any accounting firm's list is going to be tax. All accounting firms today are looking for more tax people. Consulting, most firms all have big consulting divisions. We have a large consulting division. In our firm, a lot of things come under that. Um, it's a very broad category. Usually, they say, well, I want to go into an accounting firm, I want to go into consulting. Rarely you go into an accounting firm and start in consulting. But if you start in audit and say, I want to go into consulting, sure, that's where it comes from. People who run consulting were mostly all lawyers. Accounting, you can say, what's accounting? Well, sometimes we're just doing the debits and the credits. We're helping clients actually put the numbers together. Remember, an audit is different. An audit, we're not doing the numbers. We're checking the numbers. In accounting, and smaller firms do this. Small companies don't have the ability to do their financial statements in accordance with GAAP. I don't even know what gap is. They have to sell what they sell or make what they make. So a lot of times, and we have, the, and we have a lot of what you call accounts. People go out, go to clients, take their books, make adjustments, book the depreciation entries, book the accruals, record the income taxes, do the tax returns, and give the client a full package of all their financial stuff that they don't have the, the inside capability to do it. That comes down to what we call accounting, and you would see. Remember I said before, some firms don't want to have audits? What do they do? That's what they do. They're accounting firms. They're doing the guess. So if, like, um, CPA firm does accounting, does they still have to go through this assurance process, audit? Well, it depends on the client. <laughs> when you say, do they have to go through the process? Every client has different needs. Some clients don't need assured services, okay? You're a small company. You're not borrowing money, okay? But you don't have the internal capability of generating good numbers, okay? You're running your business. You know how to sell product. You know how to make it. But you're not sure how much money you're making. And you haven't hired a good accounting staff who really knows accounting. So you're hiring your accountant. A lot of companies have an accountant who comes in every month. What does he do? He does the payroll tax returns because no one knows how to do it. He does the sales tax returns because no one else knows how to do them. He does the numbers and gives the client, you know, a compilation. Here's how you did this month. Here's your sales. I'll make the I'll make the payroll accrual. I'll make the depreciation entry. Because there are people who are qualified to do that on sale. Can you do that? And so the insurance services, sure, we do that. We actually have a department. It's called Entrepreneurial Services. <laughs> I think that's the name now. You call what we call a small business. It's a bunch of what I would call bookkeepers, okay? Very high level bookkeepers. You charge a fairly good amount of money for it. They go out to small companies and do their bookkeeping every month. Why do we have that? Well, they don't need a full time bookkeeper. They don't need somebody five days a week. They need somebody to come in three days a month. Do the payroll taxes, do the sales tax, 
post the books, make the entries, do the statements. That's accounting service. You can have all these. All these in the same firm. Okay? Does that answer your question? No. I, I'm more talking about public companies who need audit reports. So they still have to... Well, public companies very... Yes. Here's what happens sometimes. In today's world, if you have a public company, public company that needs one in four, okay, you need two accounting firms. That's what happens. You need two accounting firms. You need one to do the accounting services. They can't be the auditor. Today it is, yeah, especially at a public company, yeah. Number, but they can't be the insurance people. The insurance people can't be posting the entries. They don't have to do that anymore. We used to be able to do that. We used to be able to make a depreciation entry. We used to be able to make the tax call. Now if you don't know how to do a tax adjustment, you can't go to your auditor if you're a public company and say, could you do the tax adjustment for me? No, you got to go to that kind of firm over there. The assurance service, the, the audit's got to be clean audit. You can't be, they put that under consulting. That becomes consulting to the PCAOB now. You're helping with the entries, you're consulting with them. They're legal. So you would need two forms in that case with a public company. Does that answer your question? Okay. Personal financial planning. Can we do that? We have some personal financial planners on on board. You can do that in the accounting firm. Litigation support. This is a big area for us. Very profitable. Big area, excuse me, in a lot of accounting firms. Lawyer and lawsuits. Think about those lawsuits. There's numbers involved. Lawyers suck at numbers. They really do. They don't understand them. They don't understand the accounts. So all the times they've got to hire teams to go do the litigation support. Um, You'd be amazed how much money accounting firms make off of natural disasters. The biggest job ever done by the firm that I was with the coding side of the Congressional Merger. The biggest job Resnick ever did was they were responsible for the payout and monitoring on the Gulf Coast after Katrina. You had something like 500 people employed in the accounting firm. Monitoring the claims and paying out the claims on Katrina along the Gulf Coast. Litigation support. So you wouldn't think maybe an accounting firm would do that, but they did. Fraud investigation. That comes under, again, the same as litigation support. A division here. Um, can you do fraud investigation without being an auditor? Of course, no. I think you need to do a fraud investigation. You better know your account. You can't want to do that. And then, whoever wrote the slide didn't think if they said personal financial planning once you get it. <laughs> <laughs> so they just want to emphasize, yes, we do personal financial planning. Okay, how are public accounting firms organized? They're, they're not normally regular corporations. In fact, I've never seen one a regular corporation. A lot of times they're organized as what's called a professional corporation. Most of them are organized in these limited liability partnerships like ours. Or limited liability companies. Why? Because it protects me, the partner, from what my other partners do. They do something wrong. That was the, that's the purpose of it. Listen, they can come in and clean me out from my cone resnick assets, clean me out from the pension that I start earning in about five days, but they can't take my house if we're organized like this. So it was, wasn't me who did it. Categories of, of accounting firms, there is, I don't even know the number. I think it's something like 30 or 40 or 50,000 organizations that qualify as public accounting firms in the United States. They range really in, from a one man shop up to the big guys. Um, I said something about industry specialization. Have that in your mind. If you're going to an accounting firm, that you're going to be asked to do this. Our, the reason, most importantly today, the clients demand it. The clients demand it. When we go out on the set, the first thing we ask, when the telephone rings, and, say, and it's a prospective client, is, what's the first question I ask? What do you do for a living? What, is, what kind of company are you? And I try and get out of detail. I try and find something about the ownership. Um, 
something, sometimes something about geography. Where are they located? Try to get as much information as possible. Why? Because when a prospective client wants to meet you, they expect their accountants to know their business. They don't want to teach you their business. They expect you to know it. So it becomes extremely important that we develop expertise in a variety of industries. That's why most accounting firms today are organized not along geographic lines, they're organized more along industry lines. And we're, we're not being, uh, the, the industries are a little broader, like we'll talk like retail and consumer products as an industry. Um, manufacturing is an industry. Now, you can get more specific. Sure, if we got a manufacturing, a, a prospect in manufacturing and it's in the chemical business, I'm going to find somebody who's maybe done chemical stuff in our place. Um, if it's retail and it's an automobile, I'm going to look for somebody who knows something about the automobile industry. Because that's what they look for. So that's what we train our people, all of them, do today. It not only makes it more, more beneficial to the client for getting more out of it, but it's a better audit when we do it because we know what we're looking for, know what we're doing. Now, I'm not saying some things are hard to learn. You can, you can bounce from one business to the other and pick it up sometimes fairly quickly. But it makes for a better product when the accounting firm has an expertise in the industry to which the client is, is looking for. The firm we merge with, the resident group, at the Tesla, they have two claims to fame. And I mean, really, two claims to fame. They're the number one accounting firm in the country for affordable housing. That is an industry. It's a huge industry. They were the go-to firm if you had <coughs> if you were in the affordable housing business. There's a ton of special tax credits for affordable housing. They're experts in it, and they have a large segment of the market because of their expertise. The other thing that they're very good on was were and are good on is renewable energy. Okay, structure of a national CPA firm. Most firms are structured the same way. They're all structured. Be, be, be honest with you. All kinds of firms are going to be structured with a pyramid. The industry is based on a pyramid. If you walk into, if you walk into a job next year and... <coughs> I don't know what the statistics. Somebody say they're going to work for PwC. Somebody was, yes. I met with PwC recently. We did Rutgers. So they're all structured this way. This is not meant to, defer, to deter you from becoming a public accountant. It's not meant to deter you from wanting to be a partner. And like I said, it's extremely lucrative. You can make a lot of money. It's a high-pressure job. It takes here to here. It's I give or take a 13, 14-year period. Yeah. Partners. Is it just the title or the actual business partners? Interesting question. We have two types of partners that most firms do today. One's called equity partners and one are called non-equity partners. You start as a non-equity. You go out to the world as a partner, but if, and you get paid like you're one. You share in the profits, but you don't really own anything. You didn't put anything in, okay? You didn't put any money in. So you're not really entitled to if we were to dissolve or big things, you know, all of a sudden we sold the business. You're not you're not entitled to be paid anything. You're what's called non-equity. Most firms have those two types of partners. So most accounting firms need partners. Where's the, you know, how does the accounting firm grow? New clients, right? So what happens is you want every one of your partners to have a full plate of business. Enough work to keep them busy all the time. If you get a lot more work, you need more partners to handle the clients. The worst thing you can have is clients, partners that are overworked. What happens when they're overworked? They don't do their job. We're going to talk about what partner's responsibility is in a second. Partner is the last sign. When something goes wrong on a job, it doesn't matter who did it wrong. It doesn't matter. If this person did it wrong and this one missed it and this one missed it, it doesn't matter. You signed it, it's yours. That's what the job of the is, ultimate responsibility. If they've got too much work, they don't do what they're supposed to. So how many partners do you need? It varies. A firm of our size, we're about, I don't know. 280 to 300 today. It almost changes every day now. Partners come, partners go. We just yeah, I just saw an email coming in. <coughs> we got, I think, I forget how many are retiring this week, including one that you know. <laughs> <laughs> 46 years. This is amazing. 
Yeah. Um, so what are responsibilities? Like you said, partner, overall responsibility. Should be that the auditors perform their crunch. These are the sign people. They're the ones putting their name on the floor. They're the ones on the floor. Nobody else can sign anything in the firm. We don't want anybody signing tax returns. Got to be a partner's name. Managers. Super. This is the hardest job in the firm, in my opinion. Managers. Here's one. You want to be successful as a public accountant? You got to be a clown, juggler. Managers don't want one job. Managers want several jobs at once. One point in time in my career, I had two humongous, large, out of town jobs. One in northern Illinois and one in Texas where I'm not currently. I was flying back and forth between Illinois and Texas over the course of several weeks just keeping both jobs going. So managers have a lot of responsibilities. They are the main people to keep the jobs going. If you go to a big four firm, and I'm not being critical, you will see they're the ones who know what's going on. The partners are up here a lot of times dealing with the clients. People in the trenches know what's happening to the managers. Seniors are the in charge on a day to day basis. Yes, sir. Uh, one question. So basically, if you just want to get into the big four, like learn as much as possible, then go on your own. You'd say, like, stay until you're, you're a manager, like <laughs> that, and then leave. Here's what I would say to you, and I don't want to, see, if you're going to pay me, I'm going to get killed. Okay. <laughs> you are so. The big four is not a good learning place if you want to be a sole practitioner. Because they, they have nothing in common. Nothing in God. In the big four, you're going to be out doing a particular little segment or big segment of a humongous international global company because you're the whole part of the world. Or an order of a big global company. Doesn't prepare you at all for being a sole practitioner. The advantage of working for a big firm is that is there's a comfort in having a lot of support and support when you don't know something, which in most times you're not going to, because there's just too much to know. There's always people that are running to for whatever the subject is, okay? When you're by yourself, where do you go? What kind of clients do you get? You get these small companies. Nobody, you know, Exxon doesn't hire you to be their auditor. And your name. So you don't see normally going from here to here, okay? You, we get a lot of people, what we get, called Resnick, we get a lot of former Big Four people who don't want to be Big Four anymore, but like the comfort of a large organization with a little bit less... A little bit, what's the word? A little less form, okay? That, 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 that's all. But no, I wouldn't suggest, but, I, but you make a good point. If you're going to go to a public accounting firm, like you do, I wouldn't go for a year. If you're planning on going and leaving, and don't tell me you did going here for that, you all do, because that's the reputation you have. You all have. You're going to go back to your time. Minimum amount of time I'd say that you get anything out of the street. Any short of three years, just sort of short sure. so Make make at least a senior level. Run some jobs. Be responsible. Where you're talking to clients. <laughs> I would do that. I think until then you you miss. <laughs> What's the advantage of big firms? You cannot beat their education. Either the big four or ours. You can't beat it. Where are you going to get an education like that, which is I won't call it free. You got to work for it, but it is free. You're working and they're educating you better than anybody else can. Never part purchase. The last thing I want to talk to you about here, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit more, relationships and clients. And bring this up. Need to be, maintain independence. It's a very interesting subject. Relationship with clients. Clients don't just hire you purely for your accounting expertise. Because I think you can get good accountants in a lot of places. So when they hire you, there's a lot more to it. They're looking across the table and saying, yeah, that's who I want my accountant to be. Most accounting firms encourage the partners in particular, but the staffing will, to develop a good relationship with the client. How do you do that? Some of it's social, okay? Don't play golf with the client. <laughs> Take him to a ball game. Go, go out to dinner with him. Take his wife, you know. You and your wife take the client and their wife out to dinner. All perfectly acceptable things. But there's a line in there. There's a line. And sometimes you see people step over the line. 
Okay, we're going to talk about professional auditing standards. This is where, again, it's an auditing course, so we got to talk about auditing. What we do. And of course, we have standards by how we do it. We don't just do it. Um, there's three sets of standards. Now, they're going to cross paths a lot, the first two, because this is the U.S., this is international. I'm not going to talk about this. But we're going to talk. The AICPA sets auditing standards for private companies. And the PCAOB sets auditing standards for public companies. And all the wording we're going to see is different. They say the same thing. They really do in just different ways. Um, and they're governed by what the rules are. Uh, not on how to audit. They're not going to tell you how to audit cash. Um, they're going to tell you what the, what the basic framework of auditing is and what you need to have in place in order to have a good order. So as we said, the PCMLB, they did government the auditing, attestation, quality control, independence, ethical standards for public companies. The AICPA does the exact same thing for private companies, but they included their review standards. Because again, the PCMLB is dealing more with audits. And the AICPA is again non-public companies. So we've really said we're at post everyone and we'll come. That's what happened. We separated, separated it. The SEC said we're taking over the public companies. We're setting up this PCAOB, the it's independent board, and you guys, you accounts, can go take care of the rest of it. And then again, who's the authority? The state boards of accountancy do the licensing. You need a license to practice. You have to pay for a license here in New Jersey. Like you do, I assume, in every state in the country. And that gives you the gives you the ability to sign financial statements in that state. So if we're issuing a financial statement in New Jersey, it has to be signed off by a New Jersey CPA. So that's why sometimes now where we have clients, yes, sir. Uh, can you go across states for for licenses? Yeah, you can go across states, sure. Yeah, we have a lot of our accounts for licenses in multiple states. They're very easy to get now. But what we try to do is limit them now in our firm. <laughs> we used to have a lot of people come in and say, oh, I have a license in South Dakota, Minnesota, and uh, New Hampshire. We said, well, we don't need five accountants in New Hampshire with licenses. We don't, Because most accounting firms pay for your licenses. So we will pay for your licenses. So we're going to limit, in our case, how many you have. I mean, you want to pay for a license in South Dakota because you just like it because you used to live there. Fine, but we don't need one there, okay? But if we're issuing a financial statement in some of those states, or if a company's in those states, you need to be licensed there. It's, you it's, need to states will try to get you. You need to retake like another exam. No, no. So it's, it's called the Uniform Certified Public Accounts Exam. It's the same, same exam for them all over the country. It's not different. Different licensing requirements in states, but it's the same exam. Okay? I'm not going to try and read something this small. Um, <laughs> it's in your book. I don't know why they do this. All it does is it breaks down again. What does it tell you? This is what the, the PCOB, they can cover all this stuff under the public accounts, under the public companies, because you don't touch the private. And the ICP does the same thing over here on the private side. On we go. Let's talk about the, the principles of a gas audit. Yes, accepted auditing standards. What's the purpose, the premise under which we're auditing? What are the responsibilities of the auditor? What are our actions in performing the audit? And what are the report, re, reporting results of an audit? What is expected? <coughs> Why are we doing it in the first place? Okay. Well, again, yeah, the definition is quite clear. Provide an opinion on the financial statements that they're in accordance with applicable financial framework. Normally, gap. Okay. They could be in compliance with something else. You can actually do financial statements. In other basis, other than generally accepted accounting principles, you can do a financial statement on what's called a tax basis. You can do something that they call ABOA, other comprehensive basis of accounting. There's other ways other than that to do a financial statement, but they're rare. So we're going to deal mostly with accounting. So the purpose of order is to provide an opinion. Not to get the numbers right, but to provide an opinion that the financial statements are in accordance with GAAP. That's why we do them. 
And there's a premise to each audit. The management have responsibility. They're management's numbers. Management is able to prepare financial statements in accordance with applicable financial framework that they have, that they know how to do them. And not only do they know how to do the financial statements, they will provide the auditor the information and unrestricted access to those in the end. Unrestricted access. We have to have the ability as auditors to go talk to anybody and ask the questions we want to ask. Does anybody know the term when you're not allowed to do that, what that's called? Anybody heard this term? It's what's called a scope limitation. When the, when the client has limited the things he wants you to do. In other words, it's our job to do what we think is necessary to provide, to, to give an opinion. As a result, the client is required to pretty much comply with everything that we ask for within reason. Now, if we're unreasonable, the client is certainly entitled to hire another accountant, okay? But as long as we're within reason, they're not entitled to tell you no. If they do, you have a scope limitation. You've got a problem. They're not giving you access. <coughs> Are there examples of this? Sure. I've seen examples where a client has said, I don't want you doing that. I don't want you sending letters to all my attorneys. They're going to charge me for that. You don't need to do that. Yeah, we do need to do that. We have one particular ordinary client who, thank God I have a partner who's tough. And this particular controller likes to control our what? He wants it done. He wants it done quickly. And in his opinion, the numbers are okay. So we should be able to go in on Monday morning and be out on Monday afternoon. Everything's okay, you never find anything. What about being scope limitation? Thank God my partner's good and he smacks the client around and goes, that's not what's happening. So we get to do what we want. But so the order is be able to get whatever they want in unrestricted access. Are clients under contract? Under contract. Or do they go as like a, a fee basis? What do you mean? So let's say we have a scope limitation. The car can the client leave us because we're asking questions? Yes. Client can leave. The client could just fire you. So we're not. But here's what the requirement in our industry is. We have a very interesting requirement. We have a requirement to make a call. The subsequent auditor has a requirement to contact the predecessor auditor and ask if you had any contacts. It's the ace in the hole we have sometimes. Client says, I don't want you to see any of that stuff. I'm going to get a new one of them. Oh, fine. Be my guest. Here's the bill. I'm not paying your bill. Fine. <clears throat> when, your, when your subsequent auditor calls us to see if we had any problems, we're telling them the truth. Okay? That you wouldn't, that we had restrictions on access, you wouldn't show us stuff, and you wouldn't pay our bills. Okay? Now, if you're the subsequent auditor, taking, the, taking that engagement on? No, but we're not. Not at the. The accounting firm before you is a reputable firm, okay? You said, hey, listen, I trust the cone resident people. If they, if they walk from this client, who do I want to get involved in it for, okay? So we're, we're not on the contract, but we have... We are effectively on the... We have a contract. We have a contract that's got provisions in it. There's a provision in... Yeah, he says a contract. We have what's called an engagement letter. We're going to talk about that. Before we can start working for a client on anything, including doing a tax return for them, they have to sign what's called an engagement letter, agreeing to what we're going to do for them, what they're going to pay us, and what the terms are going to go okay? In that letter, it gives us outs, one of which is a scope limitation. If we can't do our work, we have the right to quit. Okay. We don't have the requirement to finish. Okay. okay? Personal responsibility auditor. Obviously, competence and capabilities to perform the audit in accordance with standards. In other words, you got to be qualified to do it. You can't just grab anybody off the street. I that included very important words. These are very important words in our industry. Maintaining professional skepticism and exercising professional judgment. What is skepticism? A questioning line in a critical assessment of audit evidence. Fine line. A questioning point. We're not detectives. A lot of auditors in the beginning think we're in there to catch stuff, okay? The clients don't like that. 
They think you're on their team, okay? And you are. You were hired by them to give an opinion on a financial statement. So if you treat them like the enemy, they don't like that. On the other, on the other hand, accepting what they tell you blindly without skepticism. And that's why, was it you? Who, who said something about it's going to be done by computer someday? Yeah. That was you. Why did I, I didn't say that for a thought. Said that no, no, you read that. You read that in order? I know. That was Bill Gates. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. He's smarter than I am. Maybe he's right. I'm richer than I am. Yeah, I know. Here's the thing. I don't know that a computer can have a questioning mind. When you're sitting with a client, you're asking questions, okay? <coughs> it's not just their answers. It's their whole way of doing it, okay? At some point, I'm going to tell you about a food that we had on one of our clients. One of my clients. And where we missed something, and I'll be honest, where we weren't skeptical enough, was the client kept putting off giving us the simplest piece of information back to the That was where at the end we said, what did we do wrong? Why didn't we catch it? He said it wasn't that big, okay? Why didn't we catch it? And we said the one piece of evidence that, again, skepticism, where we could have been more skeptical and go, you know, the easiest thing to do in a company is reconcile the bank why is this the last thing? Every time we ask for it, it's like tomorrow, tomorrow. And he gave it to us like if you were walking out the door on the last day. You know, in the afternoon of Friday afternoon when the order was done, we said, you can't finish without the banker, and gave us the banker. A more questioning mind would said, why? Okay? And I don't know the computer like that, okay? And when you sit with somebody in a critical and you're looking at what an evidence, are you there as a detective? No. But you know what? You've been trained as an accountant. You know what you're seeing. You know what your experience is. And sometimes things just don't look right, okay? It's not necessarily the numbers don't add correctly. It's the way they're presented. It's the way people are talking to you. It's who you're dealing with. That makes, that makes you need to be professionally skeptical. Why is the client not cooperating as much? Why is when I want to talk to her, he says, no, you don't need to talk to her. You don't talk to him, okay? You don't talk to him. You don't have to talk to her. Why can't I talk to her? It's all a matter of skepticism. Without the eyes and crossing the line of becoming antagonistic. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from error or fraud. That's what we're trying to do. So we've got to do enough to assure ourselves the numbers are good. Sometimes what happens, why can't we? I mean, um, sometimes time is one of the time is an issue, okay? This is one of the ones, this is a critical thing. Time. We sell time. That's what the lawyer said. I don't charge. I mean, I'm buying things to do a job. What happens when you wind up in time crunches? What happens when the client gets time crunches? We wind up with this problem all the time. I need this audit done by the end of March. The financial savings are due on March 31. It's March 28. We still don't have the bank confirmations back. You haven't reconciled depreciation. You haven't done this. You haven't done that. we got to be done in three days. Does this happen all the time? You need to control that and try and manage clients' expectations. And people sometimes shortcut audits because of the pricing constraints. You're doing a good job. You're doing it on the cheap. You say, listen, I don't want to get killed on this job. Let me get it done quicker. Sometimes quicker is death. And what do we watch the end of an audit? What's the end of an audit when we've done everything we should have done? All we have been, you know, the financial statements are in accordance in all material respects with the, let's just say, gap. <coughs> How can he have an independence? He now wants, he now has the best interest in this company. He wants it to succeed. He's going to work there. That's why he can't be there anymore. So we need an independence and mental attitude about what we're doing. And do professional care. You don't just, I, you sound very generalized, and they sort of are. But you got to do careful work. That's why we spend so much time doing it, so much time checking it. You, if you miss some of these things, this is where you get in trouble on an audit. These are all the things the attorneys go after <coughs> if there's a problem. 
Standards of field work. Now we're going to do the job. We've got the right people on it. What's the first thing we got to do? Adequately plan and properly supervise. Adequately plan and properly supervise. Firms have a requirement. I know we do, and I'm sure all major firms do. There is a requirement of a planning meeting. There must be a meeting of the audit staff with attendance by everybody on the job, including the partner, to properly plan the engagement. Got to be documented. You can't just go out there and just start auditing. There's got to be proper planning and proper supervision. First thing the lawyers look for. Okay, let me see the amount of hours spent on this engagement. Oh, 2,000 hours spent on the engagement. How many hours was the partner there? Oh, three. How many hours was the manager there? Oh, five. Who's the rest of it? Oh, there's all the staff doing the work. Was it properly supervised? No. So the amount of hours spent on an engagement has got to be allocated properly amongst the different levels. <laughs> we look all the time at our partner hours to make sure that our partners are spending the adequate amount of time on each one of their jobs. Are they going out of the field? Are they looking at work papers out of the field? Are they spending enough time with the engagement? Are they there at the planning meeting? That may sound like, a, <coughs> excuse me, apple pie in America, but it's not. And we found too many instances in the, in the past. But I don't want to sit in a planning meeting. That's too boring. I have better things to do. Not allowable. Must obtain a sufficient understanding of the entity, its environment, including internal control, to assess the risk of material misstatement, design further order procedures. Can't just go out and audit. Can't grab last year's work papers and say, okay, let's go. You got to understand the client. That's why it's so important you should have industry expertise. You've got to understand the industry the company is dealing in. You've got to know a lot about the company, their record keeping, their people, their qualifications, the quality of the work these people produce. It's one of the first things we talk about when we, we go out for an audit. How good are the internal people? Are they quality people who are going to give us a nice package? <laughs> As we walk out there, they hand us all the work papers, the financial statements, they go. What are they going out there? No, they're not done with this yet. They haven't done that yet. They don't know how to do this. They don't know how to do that. All part of planning the audit is knowing the, st the staff that you're dealing with at the client. And, of course, assessing the risk of material misstatements for whatever the reason. And again, what's the standard? You've got to get enough information to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence to form an opinion. You can always figure out when they didn't do enough of an audit on a prior account to pick up the work papers. And it's a global company and the work papers are this thick. Well, did they do any work? Or that I just sort of glance over it. Have I seen that? Of course. When does that happen? Usually when the dollars for the job don't afford doing enough work. And you've got to make a decision whether you want to put your name on the line of your reputation, signing something when you haven't done enough work to form the opinion that you're supposed to be. So it's collecting, and when we go through each of the different subjects that we're going to go through, when we talk about cash, receivables, payables, we're going to talk about how do you get enough audit evidence in each of the particular topics. How do you audit the receivables? How do you audit inventory so that you can satisfy that standard of field work? What are the standards of reporting? Say where those financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAAP. That's what we're there for, so that's the first standard. Identifying circumstances in which principles are not consistently applied. They do something different this year than they did last year. Are they writing off fixed assets completely different? I mean, they're hiring inventories the same way. Are they, are they handling the accounts receivable reserves the same way? Last year, were they very aggressive? This year, they're very conservative. So are they applying the principles on a consistent basis? Make sure there's enough disclosures. That the disclosures are adequate or otherwise stated in the report. What does that mean? Informative disclosures are adequate unless otherwise stated in the report. Well, if you don't give the proper disclosures, you actually have to tell the reader everything that you were supposed to know isn't here. And I'm going to give you a very good example that we run into. 
We do a large financial services practice. We do a lot of what are called hedge funds. Some of them are very closely held. <coughs> and the hedge fund manager, who's been performing well, says, I don't want to build a world of investment. Sorry, I don't want to give you a list. You're doing well, you're making a lot of money. You don't need to know the list. I don't want to share it. It's my proprietary information. Unfortunately, there's a disclosure requirement in the financial services industry of giving a list of what the investments are. Some clients go, I'm not doing it. I don't care. I'm not doing it. I'm not giving a list. I don't want to give that information out. Got to say something to report. Financial statements are in accordance with GAAP, other than that there's no, that there's no schedule of investments as required under generally accepted accounting principles. So you're giving the disclosures, but you're saying, hey, something's missing. Because can you finish an order like that? Yeah. Like Again, you just give the information. Informative disclosures are adequate. What's well, otherwise stated? I'm saying, you can't tell me. What are you doing? Tell me you can't do it on the shoe? I'm not doing it. Tell me. We're not doing it. I don't want the people I'm buying some very tightly held securities. I'm not buying Exxon, Mobil, and Bank of America. I'm buying things I don't want the world knowing. And I want to disclose. I think I'm going to take a really lot of some stuff here. But I don't want you to know it. And you tell her, and she tells her, I don't want you to do it. You're making a lot of money, be quiet and be sad. But I'm not telling. And of course, the report's got to clearly state the degree of responsibility of somebody who is. By expressing a penny or saying that one cannot be expressed in the least. What if you can't express an opinion? You have such a. Uh... Now, does that happen often? No. Because most times you resolve things because clients, need, they need your opinion, so they can't be in a position where they don't get it, so you normally resolve things. But if you had such scope limitations that you couldn't give an opinion, or you couldn't learn some things, like, I think I told you that story. We had this chain of jewelry stores in the, that we had picked up as a potential client in the Caribbean. Couldn't back, document the inventory numbers. Just couldn't do it. They didn't have records. We couldn't express an opinion on the financial statements. Because we couldn't audit the inventory, which was the largest balance sheet audit number, and obviously affected the income statement. We told them we can't do an opinion. We can't give you an opinion. We can't audit the number. They didn't want to. We didn't have any use to them once we couldn't give them a financial statement. So we put it list. And I don't know where they went from there. I don't think they could have found anybody to do it. Or some somebody's won't sign their name to anything. We don't do stuff like that. I don't like that slide. I don't particularly care for this one either. There's a hierarchy. What that means is when you've got a problem, like how to do auditing, so if the, the same thing was in generally accepted accounting principles. Well, in what order do the rules written? Well, in gas, in generally accepted accounting standards, the standards come first. If there's something that you can't find in the standards and handling something, there's other things that have been written. They're called interpretive publications, <laughs> people's written stuff, and then other auditing publications. Auditing practice releases, technical practice aid, audit risk alerts. These come out all the time. Audit risk alerts. Something in the industry, something in the world economy, all of a sudden says, hey, be careful. Collateralized mortgage obligations, let's give you years ago, became very risky. The ICPA issues these things to the accountants and says, hey, this is a bad area in the economy today. Be careful of this particular area of auditing. <laughs> This is something that people always going into accounting are interested in. What's our responsibility for the detection of errors and fraud? This is where we have what's called the expectation gap. The difference between what we think we're doing, what our responsibility is, and what the world thinks we're doing. What's the first thing we want to find out when we do it? What are the risks? Today, auditing has come full circle in a lot of respects. We didn't used to think risks. I don't think I ever thought that word when I started. But today, we're taught everybody's using what's called risk-based auditing. What's the chances that there's a material misstatement or fraud in the financial statements? Let's gear our audit procedures to eliminate or reduce the possibility of there being something really wrong as a result. So what do you think? And of course, information about the company and its environment. When I say environment, 
What are they doing? What's going on in the world today? That's why auditing from the year of like 2008 until recently was so risky. Because everybody was losing money, having problems, being in trouble, being at risk with their banks, being in default of loans, not earning money. The environment was bad. When the environment's bad, the inherent risk of a bad audit goes up. Inquiries of management and others. <coughs> Let me talk about this for a second. There's a requirement under, I think it's called SAS 99, numbers 99. We have a requirement as auditors to do fraud inquiries. We have a requirement to do fraud inquiries. Now you may say, somebody's committing a fraud, I'm going to admit it to you. Well, what you do as an auditor today is you go out and you select a variety of people in the company, various levels, various positions, and go out with a very standardized checklist and ask a lot of questions <coughs> relative to the possibility of there being either actual stealing fraud or financial fraud. You ask questions about internal control, who does what, and it's a requirement. You've got to actually go out and you've got to, of course, talk to the accounting people. You've got to talk to top level management. And then you've got to talk to select other people in the company who are in a position to possibly know about or commit fraud. You might talk to the receiving manager. You might talk to somebody in shipping. Um, and based on that, you're going to devise tests in order to determine whether or not there is or a material misstatement of financial statements. It's a requirement to put us to that. So once you've done your assessment, you've, had, you've talked to people, you've gone through the internal controls, you've seen what's gone on in prior years, and you've assessed the overall state of the world, so to speak, if you look at your company, you're going to determine and plan tests to obtain reasonable assurance that there aren't misstatements. What are the things I look for? Well, is a bank loan coming due? Okay, bank loans coming due. There's probably financial covenants on there. Please, is there possibly, is there a risk the company is going to fortunately present financial statements? In order to get the loan extended, of course there is. Are they in a bad industry? Are they in a real estate industry during the turn now between, you know, 2008 past? Are they able to get bonding to, to do more uh, construction? Things of that nature. Was there tremendous turnover in the accounting department? There's a problem. Look at the lifestyle of the people. I mean, there's just so much you can do as an experienced intelligent auditor that gives you that sense, that smell test of what you need to do and whether there's a possibility of a material misstatement and why. Again, that professional skepticism. What's the chances that there's something really wrong? Probably got to tell the whole story. As I was telling this is an front that we had in our that we caught. We were doing a, a long time ago as a young partner, and we were doing an audit of a public company that was in. I hope you all know what I want to talk about: the pay telephone business. Anybody not know what a pay telephone is? <laughs> they don't exist anymore. Back before those things, and you needed to make a phone call, and you weren't home, you went to the corner, and you went somewhere, and there was a phone on the wall, and you put money in. And you could make <laughs> I know I'm being a wise guy, but that was what they had business they were. No, 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 no. It was a small public company selling the phones. They were selling and renting the phones themselves. They weren't the telephone company. They weren't operating on revenue generated from the phones. They were generating sales and rentals from buying paid telephones and finding companies to take them. 
There was an asset on the books. This is again where the smell test came in. A large receivable on the books. And the receivable was from the number one salesman in the company. And when we went to the, when my auditors went to talk to the client about this, said you have this large receivable due from this sales guy. They said, Yep. We had this group of telephones, large group of telephones, and we weren't doing real well. But he had an idea to do this. He came to us and said, listen, there's a lot of small automobiles repair shops around in this world. And when you go to an automobile place, sometimes you get your car fixed, you go in, you find out they've got to keep your car, you may have to sit and wait. And you may need to make a telephone call, somebody to pick you up, you need to call somebody to say you're going to be late. So a lot of these automobile repair shops need to pay telephone. And I'm going to go into that business and I'm going to lease them, lease them to these repair shops. So he supposedly bought the telephones from the company, debit receivable credit sales revenue, made the company made a nice profit on selling them. And in order to collateralize, to secure these, this receivable, the salesman pledged the leases against the receivables. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So he put up quiet and said, okay, if I can't pay for it, you can just take over the leases. It sounded like a legitimate transaction. My auditors just said, we don't like it. There's something wrong here. What? If something doesn't snow. And they wouldn't give it up. So they demanded to see the leases. We want the leases. Client came up, came up, and them a pile of leases. Here they are. Now when we started looking at them, and they noticed a couple things in a computer room. One, they noticed that on every lease, the signature on the bottom of the page of the lessor, let's see, the lessee, who's your lessor? Everyone. Fifty leases you couldn't read one second. Everyone had a script. Now fifty, this is again common sense. Fifty script, fifty times they can't read one. And why I read one? And two, they weren't on the paper strip. It wasn't like a nice lease form. Oh my god, they just looked fun. They just looked fun. So my two other, the two the two managers on the account said, we're not giving up on this. We just, we just don't like it. We sense a rat. So they decided to go one step further. Not a common order procedure. They took one of the leases, looked for the address, and that night one of my managers drove to the location, went into the repair shop, looked on the wall, voila, no telephone. Okay? Came running back to me the next day, said, I told you this is no good. These don't exist. This is all sham. Those leases, the paper didn't look right, the signatures didn't look right. I said, okay, are there any in the town that we're working in? And sure enough, there was one in that town. So at lunchtime, we all said evening lunch, we drove to the automobile repair shop. And I'll never forget this because I was scared. I really was. I, didn't, I was nervous. I was a young partner. I was auditing a public company and I got problems here. I got, I got something bad. It may sound like nothing, but it's not easy to know how to handle a situation like this. So what we did is we parked our car, and the three, there were three of us, we started walking up and down the street. And we got up to the repair shop, and we sort of did, I didn't want to walk in and ask if they had public telephone. It's <laughs> sort of stupid. The three of us spotted on the wall. So we walked by and did this, and then scurried down the street again. <laughs> and we did it like three times. And the third time, I saw see the phone, but I was like, I don't know what to do, guys. The guy came, the owner of the place came out and he was like, what do you want? And I went, well, did, did you lease a phone, a public, a, a public telephone, and I remember that it was the ABC company. The ABC leasing company, it was something very common. He was like, go away, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't have a public telephone. There are the ABC leasing company. I don't have a phone here, I didn't lease it from anybody. Now I knew we had a fraud. With my orders, the smell test. We went back, I told everybody, we packed up our work papers. We just packed them up. I said, get the work papers and go back to the office. 
pulled the executive committee, management committee of the firm, went back over the management committee and said, we have a, we have a fraud on the public company. This whole transaction is a complete scam. Doesn't exist. Um, they called the office, they called the president and the top officers of the company and said, we want you to meet tomorrow morning. It's, it's a Friday, don't forget that. Saturday morning. So, we want you in our office tomorrow morning. And one of the guys said, I can't be there tomorrow, we're going to ski. He said, we really don't care if you want to go skiing. Because at 9 a.m. Monday morning, we're on the phone with the SEC reporter. They were in our office the next morning. Believe <laughs> <laughs> me, they were. We made every adjustment. We wrote off everything. And within a very short period of time, the company filed back. But it was a matter of, again, my auditors, it was that skepticism. It was like, they could have bought it. The paperwork, I mean, there were leases. They backed up these receivables. They just didn't let the look at them. So it was, you know. Anyway, what's our, what's our responsibility when it comes to compliance with laws, okay? Well, if it's a law, if laws that involve financial statement stuff, then we have a responsibility to make sure the companies are in compliance with them. If they were violating importing or exporting laws and doing something dramatically wrong, yeah, you would have some type of responsibility to find that and detect the non-compliance. But if it's other laws that have no direct effect on the financial statements, you find out that trucks are speeding every day, um, you're not responsible for anything like that. Thing like that. There's something that's for retention that's material or that there's a problem. You, you can go look into it. But for the most part, your only responsibility as an auditor is to make sure the companies comply with the laws that affect the financial statements. The most obvious one, do they file tax returns everywhere they're required to file tax returns? We're not talking just federal. Do they file their federal returns? Do they file their state returns? And if not, you got to do something about it. What does the standard auditor's report contain? We're, we're moving along nicely. We'll be done already. Done. Every standard auditor's report, auditor's reports are standard. There is no room for changing the letter in here. You can't change the words. Clients can't change the words. If they ask you, can we change it and word it differently? The answer is absolutely not. We are bound by the rules. One, well, each one's going to have a title. Sounds silly, but yes, they have to have a title. They have to have an addressee. Usually it's the owner of the business, board of directors, audit committee. And it wouldn't be to the controllers, but it's got to be somebody usually at the owner level or the level like that. Like I said, board of directors. So the title of the financial statements, an addressee, content sections, four, content, four, four paragraphs. You need all four. <laughs> an you need an introductory paragraph. We have audited. So you tell them what we did. You'll see the words in a little bit. Manage, the second paragraph talks about what management's responsibility was. The third paragraph talks about what the auditor's responsibility was. And the fourth one is what the opinion is on those financial statements. So an introduction, here's what management does, here's what the auditor does, here's the opinion. Then, important, signature, got to be signed. They're not valid unless there's a signature on the bottom. Banks, whatever, will not take them, and we don't sign them. We may send them out in draft, but we don't put a signature on them until they're ready to go. Without the signature, they're not valid. City and state of office issuing the order reports. Very important. And legal reasons. We don't just issue them anywhere. If they're issued in New York, office, they come out with a New York address. And this one is important. We'll talk about later what's so important about that. The date. Because that date on the financial statement fixes the date that the auditor is responsible for them. For them. So if it's a January, if it's a December 31st statement, and we're signing off on it on March 15th, that means we have responsibility to be looking at transactions through March 15th to see if they have any effect on the financial statements. So that date is important. And we'll find out later how you determine that date. You don't just pick a random date. That date is a very definitive, defined date as to what it is. So the introductory paragraph. Every financial statement. We have ordered the company for consolidated balance sheets. 
And the remaining consolidated savings of income retained during the cash flow for the years that ended. Okay, it's an end deduction. Here's what we did. We audited. There's nothing in there changing. Nothing. The second one, what's manager's responsibility? Manager's responsible for the presentation and preparation and fair presentation. Again, in and on management, these are their numbers. And they're done in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in the United States of America. Very important to point out. This is the R gap. This is an international gap. Talks about the internal controls and a fair presentation. All tied in here without reading every word. This is management's responsibility. What's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to express an opinion. And that's what that talks about. Okay? And then there's a description of what and what it is. And it goes through exactly these words again. We'll talk about fairness and internal controls. I'm not going to read you every word of it. But it talks about what our responsibility is. And then we go into the last paragraph that says here, we believe that the evidence we obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our audit opinion. And then we give an opinion. In our opinion, the consolidated statements for the two above fairly present. This is what's called a clean opinion. That's the terminology we use. In other words, it's, we're giving an opinion with no exceptions. Everything's okay. And we've now expressed that we think we said. Here's what they did. Here's what we did. Here's, what, here's how we did it. And this is our opinion about the financials. What about the term qualified opinion? We're getting to qualified, okay? We'll get to qualified. This is an unqualified opinion. What's Carl was talking about? Unqualified opinions. Not a qualified opinion. That's when there's something that's not in accordance with GAP. I have one of those, and I have it on our largest client. For some very strange reason, we have a company that doesn't want to account for their fixed assets in accordance with GAP. Had this discussion for years with the client. They're adamant about it for no reason that I can say is valid to me as an accountant. <clears throat> they just want to keep their books and their tax return the same when it comes to finance to fixed asset accounting. So they use tax depreciation methods on their books. We've explained to the client. That's not generally accepted accounting principles. We can't do that without saying something. And the client, for whatever reason, very successful company says, I don't really care. Say what you want. I just don't want to go through the bother of two methods of depreciation. We try to explain to the client, but we do the calculation, so it's not going to really impact you, but they don't want to do it. And I gave up arguing years ago. So we have a qualified opinion. We say the financial statements are in accordance with GAAP, except for the method of accounting for, for fixed assets, where the accounting is done in accordance with tax accounting. And then we even say, had it been done under GAAP, here's what the difference would be, and here's what the numbers would be. So you can have qualifications. <coughs> You can have qualifications with an emphasis of the matter. Change the accounting principles. You can sometimes say something in a, in a paragraph that emphasizes to look at a footnote. If you have a uh, going concern problem, yes, sir. Verify the numbers correct. You mean tax appreciation? Yeah, we verify the tax appreciation right. It doesn't matter. It's wrong. It's not the right way of doing it. They also had an issue with us a couple years ago. They had a piece of uh, property. They moved their, their offices from one building to another. And they couldn't sell the first building, so we had a valuation issue. We said, everything our, everything that we see tells us that this building needs to be written down. And we all write the building down. Yeah, but you have to. No, we don't. We don't all write that. We got another gap exception. Okay, fine, put it in your opinion. I don't care. I don't care if there's a gap exception. Okay. Stop arguing. We'll say to the world, you didn't do it right. You don't care. And you want to know something? What would be what is in the financial statements? Okay. A very successful company. It doesn't, it, it materially distorts the bottom line 
But as a risk factor, it doesn't really make a difference because it's a non-cash item. So if they do the appreciation wrong, it's a company that makes a lot of money. So instead of maybe making $70 million, they show they made $65 million. $5 million on $70 million is material. It's material. If you were a public company, it would make a difference. This is a private company, very successful. There's no risk. This is where we look at risk. We go, who's going who's to come back to us and sue us? We're going to sue us because depreciation, we say depreciation is done wrong. We tell you how much it's done wrong by. And they're still very proud. Have grounds for a loss so you can have a loss. Who's losing money here? None of the vendors are losing money. Nobody's lending them money. Do we look? That's how you assess risk sometimes. What can happen? Well, nothing can really happen. Who's going to really? There's no harm, no foul. But it's not according to GAP, and we can't say that because if they come in and look at our fight, look at our peer review, comes in and goes, don't you know you can't do that? We look pretty stupid. So anyway, once again, you have a qualified opinion, you have a scope limitation. Or a departure from GAP. We have a we have a qualified opinion because we have a uh, departure from GAP. But if you got a scope limitation, hey, we couldn't verify the inventory. <laughs> if it's not that material. If it's so material, if the departure from GAP is so significant the financial statements are misleading, you must call an adverse opinion. But the fact of the matter is you'll never see one. Because you never get to that point. That's what the rules say you can do. You think any clients are going to allow that? They're going to fire them first, okay? <coughs> or a disclaimer of an opinion. You can't come up with one. They hired us to do it. We have no idea. We can't or we can't audit these numbers. They're all auditable. Is there is there a is there a spot for in the uh, SASs for this? Yeah. Does it happen? No. It doesn't happen because you don't companies hire you to get to do audits. They need them. They can't wind up in these situations. You can't have any of these for a public company. SEC will not accept it. SEC gets a report on one of these, it goes back. Or they suspend trading. That's what they can do. When they don't get what they want, they suspend trading in your securities. So but none of those are acceptable under uh, SEC guidelines. <laughs> public order, what's different in a public company on a report? Some of the wording's different. That's all. And I'm not going to get hung up on this. It talks about different standards. It's got a different title. It talks about the internal control. And some of the other parts are a little bit more brief. Quickly, let's look at a couple of the other things we do. John, we talked about attestation. We've been talking about audit so far. What are some of the other things that we do that are called attestation services? We can sort of slap the name on them. Or accounts are required to slap the name on them. Because the, because the reader, the ultimate user, wants to see somebody look at it. This is a big one. Financial forecasts and projections. Forward-looking numbers. <laughs> this is where skepticism and intelligence and experience comes in. When you're sitting with a client and they got to do a projection or a forecast, we're going to buy a business. Let's try to figure out how much money we're going to make. Well, that's not auditable until something in the future. There's no documents that are going to tell you what's going to happen. No crystal ball. This is where you're sitting down and you're trying to look at things that are reasonable and you're using your skepticism. And when the client says, yeah, I think I'm going to be able to grow this business 50% a year. And you go, no, I don't think that sounds reasonable to me. How are you going to make a business grow 50% a year? That doesn't sound right. So we do a lot of this kind of work. It's an IFS work. Pro forma financial statements. Anybody know pro forma means? Pro forma is when you count for something as though it occurred. You take numbers and you change them as though an event had occurred. Pro forma. What if we had sold the building last year? What would the numbers have looked like? Pro forma. You put that in there. If we had bought the company last year, what would our what would our financial statements have looked like? Reports on internal control. We can do reports on compliance with laws. MDNA, management discussion and analysis. If you ever hear the term MDNA, if you go into public account, you will. Every public account, public companies, quarterly and finance and annual reports, management has to write a, an extensive verb extensive verbiage telling the reader in so many words. 
Here's how we get it. Here's what was good, here's what was bad, and why. Yeah, here's the numbers. Why did sales go? Yeah, you can read and see sales went up, but you don't know why. In there, that's what they talk about, and they give extensive information to help the reader. It's called an MDNA. Towns are required to read these things and make sure that they're written properly and that companies don't lie too much. They really are an area most of the time management's going to puff something. In other words, they almost use the sales tools. We want to tell our we want to tell our share all those good things. Sometimes things aren't so good, you have to write it in there. So that's an important thing management has to do. It's called an MDNA. And then we do what's called an agreed upon procedure. Sometimes there's something and somebody wants us to test. For whatever reason, something in the fight, something in the fight in a financial area, we go in. Okay, you want us to do this? Here's the procedures that you agree we will do. We will do this. We will do that. <coughs> we will do this. Surrender report. These will come under what's in accounting under these under the uh, SAS is called general attestation. Elements of quality control of an accounting firm. Accounting firms pride themselves on their quality. I know it's one of the things I've always been so proud of about the company I work for. Whether we make mistakes or not, and we certainly do them, we push the quality of our work. The, 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 the world expects the accounting firms to do quality work. What is it that we have to do to ensure that? What are the elements of quality control? Tone at the top. First thing, management of the accounting firm has to stress the quality of work. Leadership responsibilities. In our firm, our CEOs constantly are pounding upon our people to make sure the work that we do is something that we're proud of. No schlocky work. No trying to make money for the sake of making money. More important to do quality work than necessarily just be profitable. Just as important, quality of the clients that we take in. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. What we do to, to ensure that the quality, as important as it is, but I have people do this. Cool up. You know, I've heard a lot of good things about Chrome. I think I want to hire you guys. Good things about you. I go, well, that's really wonderful. Okay, so when do we start? No, we're not starting. Here. Why? I don't know who you are. This is important as you interviewing us to become your accountants. We interview our prospective clients to make sure we want. And I'll tell you in a few seconds some of the things we do that are required and some of the things we find out. Of course, relevant ethical requirements, we very important to quality control. Acceptance and continuance of clients <laughs> and engagements. I got to do it today. New acceptance policies. It is not easy in a public accounting firm. And this is how we bring a client in, and it's just like that. Oh, we got a new captain. Good, let's go do the audit tomorrow. There is a whole acceptance policy of every accounting firm that you go through before they're willing to do your work. Because it only takes one or two bad clients to ruin an accounting firm. See Arthur Anderson, okay? Two bad clients brought down the world's largest accounting firm. Two. So acceptance and continuance. In our acceptance procedures, we do background checks. We will do background checks on, on the principles of the company. Before we'll do your accounting, we do background checks. Have we ever found criminal activity in clients' backgrounds? I unfortunately can tell you, yes, we have. And then we'll go a step further and see what it is, what, is this a client, where, who are they censored by, what did they do, is this a person we want to deal with? Same thing with continuance. You had a bad client, client is getting in a lot of trouble. You saw you get started getting that pit in the stomach, you're going, I don't know, I don't find anything, but I just don't feel good about it. We're getting killed on the audit. They're pushing us out the door to be done quicker than we want to be. I don't like the way this company's going. We're having trouble getting paid. What reason after reason. So not only does all firms have an acceptance policy. Like I said, that it requires as much as a legal background check, but a continuation <laughs> what? continuance policy. And all firms throw clients out. They do. We do it, all big firms will do it. Don't like the client, don't, don't want to take the risk, it's not worth it, you get the clients. I mean, 
I, there's a client that we got rid of one time. We, I didn't, we didn't like it. It was the worst client I've been in my 46 years. There was nothing. We did a risk profile in this company when I became the partner on it. They failed every question. This was a client that, when he called me in the office, the stomach answered. He said, just roll. All my secretary had to say was jacks on the phone. I could just feel my guts coming up. This was a guy. I remember sitting in his office with him one day, and when I walked in, he said, I'm in a meeting with you, Michael. Sat down in an office about the size of this room. Sat down and I heard clicks. Meaning the doors just locked. I said, just, I didn't like this guy. We didn't even know how to get rid of this company. Everything was wrong with this company. Everything. We eventually priced it out of our, priced it out. We raised the fee on the guy the next year. He got all pissed. Went somewhere else. Went to a big four. I'll never forget talking to the partner the next year of the big four who lamented taking this account <laughs> oh, It was just a horror show. Well, this is why, like, you see, all seeing, like, sometimes you see it's not selected for SA94 or something like that. No, no. This one was. This company was in the nursing home business. They were in nursing homes. And if you look at, if you look at nursing homes and medical, the receivables are. Old and very important. It's very, it takes sometimes in these businesses a year or two years sometimes to collect the receivables. The reserves would be a debt on them, hard shows, trying to verify things, and then the company had terrible records. And this guy was just scared. I just never knew when I was going to get whacked on this job. Human <laughs> resources. HR. Which, how does HR fit into elements of quality control? Very important thing when the peer reviewers come into us, they check our HR records. Are we, what are our hiring practices? Who are we hiring? They look at our records. Are we hiring the right people? Are we hiring quality people? Are we reviewing them regularly? What are the reviews like? Are our systems in place to make sure that we have the right people hired and the right people on jobs? So HR is an extremely old important element of quality control. Engagement performance. Most firms have a policy on quality control. We do. If I'm a partner on a job, I don't issue a report. I'm not the last, I'm not the last resort. Job comes up, managers do all the work. I as a partner, one partner, we do Sign off on it, check the reports, sign off on it. Not done. It goes to a final level of something called a quality control department, who are a bunch of the best accounts we have who like to work in turn. We don't deal with the clients too much. They read the reports, they check for gap, they check the, they check the work papers to make sure they're in compliance with gas, they roll all the forms, and we have engagement letters, rep letters, all the things that you need for a quality job. So there's a final step in most work in what's called a quality control department. It not only exists on the audit side, it exists on the tax side. Before a tax return goes out, it's checked also to make sure that it's in compliance with the laws. And lastly, monitoring. After we've done all this, we do our own internal monitoring, and then we do external monitoring. In other words, we have our own quality, we have a group of people that go office to office, pull jobs, and make sure that they're in compliance, and all firms do this, with everything that they are done in accordance with gas, done in accordance with gap, and making sure our are working. And what they do is they select them from each part. So if I was still in one partner, they go get two Michael Cohen jobs. And they pull different ones, or jobs that are of higher risk, to make sure I'm doing my audits in accordance with firm policy and in accordance with gas. So we do a monitoring, and then there's outside monitoring. All firms have that. Many firms that do what? It's about monitoring for the NACPA. So what you find with all the quality firms that all of you are going to work with is this culture of quality. Okay. The last thing in the world accounting firms can live through is a impression in the marketplace that the work that's coming out is not at the appropriate level of quality it needs to be. If you look at the big four, what are they doing? They're auditing companies 
that represent the, the majority of the economy of this country and the world. If they're not doing things in a quality basis, what confidence can you have in numbers? What confidence can you have in financial statements if they're not doing everything the way they're supposed to be doing? Ethical. Yeah. We have to sign off every four makes your employees do this. Independence every year. We need to sign off every year. Every firm does this. Yes. Every employee in the firm for an independence statement. That you're not doing anything to jeopardize your independence. That goes down to not only investing in our clients, which you are assuming though you can't do. You can't buy stock in a company that the company is away. Okay? You're public company. You know how to do that. But in addition, even loans are discouraged. You shouldn't be borrowing money from your clients. Say, so, well, how do I borrow money from the clients? What if they're in a mortgage business? Should you be getting your mortgage on your house from your client? Well, the answer is no. Should you be borrowing money from a bank that we want? No. I mean, if it's in the tier and they borrow five grand, nobody's going to care. But if you borrow a million dollars from a bank and you're on the audit, they're going to have a natural built in bias? Yeah. <coughs> so we require, and all firms require, an annual sign off on independence that says you haven't done anything to violate me. You're not in business with clients, you're not doing anything with clients. We talked about acceptance and continuous. Again, we constantly measure our client integrity, and then they're not doing anything illegal, and then we can trust them. Remember, when they do something bad, it's not just on them. It happens to us. We talked about HR, that, we, that we've hired the right people, that we're reviewing them properly, that their recruitment processes are in place. Meeting minimum academic requirements. We had a bad situation a few years ago. We hired a partner in a consulting division who had been a partner in another major firm. We had a partner, a major accounting firm, moved over to us. One day we started with this, we did a background check on it. And then we lied about one something. He didn't have a college degree. He didn't have a college degree. He told us where he got his college. We checked. He didn't go to college yet. He didn't have a college degree. I can honestly tell you that was his last day working for us. Yeah, what? What? He's not there anymore. <laughs> we fired him. <laughs> he went over the next time. Yeah. Once we did the background check and found out he didn't really graduate college. How the other firm didn't catch him, we don't know. All the individuals, smart guy, knew his stuff. You can't have that. Well, wasn't there government regulations would be that big of a deal? Is that the only reason? Because you can't sign off on stuff unless you're a CPA. Would it be a big, big deal that he wasn't a college graduate? You gotta sort of take it down to you take it down to what happened. Well, first of all, you've got an unethical person yeah, yeah, yeah. We thought I'll tell you this in the accounting firm. They catch you faking something. We have had this happen. You find an auditor is faking procedures. Most firms that I know we do terminate you on the spot, no matter what you've done. If we can't trust your work to be authentic, we terminate employees. You can't have that. Because if that gets caught in a lawsuit, we just write the check. We're done. We're done. Write the check. You didn't really do what you said you were going to do. You didn't catch that your, your junior accountant lied about the confirmation and didn't really send confirmation and fake that he did those procedures. You might as well just sign the check. You lost the lawsuit. So you can't put yourself in that position. But no firm tolerates that stuff. They don't tolerate it once. It's a, it's a no exception policy. We had one a couple of years ago, kid. Nice kid. Worked there a few years ago. A few years. What happened? Tell you the story. Somebody followed his procedures the next year and said, okay, i got to verify these contracts. Somebody said, there are no contracts. He said, yeah, there are. The auditor last year verified he looked at all these. The person says, I was here last year. He didn't verify anything, and he couldn't have verified those contracts because they don't exist. We don't have contacts for that particular type of a transaction. Which is verified. Called the auditor in and said, you didn't really do it in this firm. No, I didn't do it. I just said I did it. Make sound draconian? Yeah. You get sued on that job, you done. Ethics. This built this business is built on ethics. They say monitoring. Firms do it internally, all the firms do it. 
They check it internally and they have outside people monitor them. Quality control, like I said, every firm has quality control procedures. Everyone will be different. Constantly checking your own work with it. That's your order to make sure that it's as good as it can be. <coughs> Quickly, regulation. PCUB, we talked about this. They control the public companies. They conduct inspections of all the public accounting firms that do public firms. If you wanted a public company, you have to register with the PCAOB. They come in and look at it. Non public companies are governed by the ICP and state boards. I'm not going to give you the facts on that. What makes up the PCAOB? Peer reviews. This is under the ICP. This is for when you do non public work. If you do audits, they come in. You can join one of two groups. They get what their names are. One group that you can either be involved in the group that does audits. And they come in and do a peer review on that. Or there's another group where if you say, I'm not going to do any audits, and the peer review is a lot, lot less intense. These are things are put on public record. You can report gas, pass with deficiencies, or fail a peer review. Sometimes prospective clients ask you for your peer review. They want to see what your what your peers have said in terms of reviewing your work. They want to know that you're quality. And oftentimes we get this for our peer review letters. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on PCA or B inspections. They're just, let's just, uh, we'll just say they, a lot like what a proctologist would do. They're not, fine. <laughs> <laughs> They're not nice people. And they don't have to be, they don't care. Um, I'm talking about international accounting standards. I don't, an international order report, we're not going to talk about that. 